Hello and welcome to Cabrum and Aquarium's Discovery Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Julianne Passarelli, the Education and Collections Curator at Cabrum and Aquarium. I'll start with just some information for the viewers. This is a webinar style platform, so you cannot see yourself, nor can you mute or unmute yourself. But any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A feature. Typically it's at the bottom of your screen, but it could be at the top but it's typically in a bar, uh, either on the top or the bottom of your screen. Uh, our speaker tonight may have some interactive slides with you. So just follow her lead and put your answers and comments for her in the chat. We will get to the questions at the end of the lecture. During the lecture, if you think of a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A uh, feature. We will also be monitoring the chat but please use that for any specific questions about the aquarium. All questions directly for our speaker can go into the Q&A. Cabrumon Aquarium is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks, and we are extremely grateful for the city's support. I would also like to thank the aquarium's director, Chrislyn McCarran, and the program's director, Jim DePompe, for their support. And a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. The aquarium is open from Wednesdays through Sundays from noon to five. All capacity restrictions have been removed and we are resuming programming and we are following all state and city health department requirements. Masks are required at all times, including while in the courtyard area. In addition, please be aware that the city of Los Angeles indoor vaccine mandate is now in effect. If you are planning on coming to the aquarium, please be prepared to show proof of COVID vaccination. This is required for anyone 12 and older, and if you are 18 and older, please also be prepared to show a photo ID. Your actual vaccination card, a digital copy, copy of your COVID-19 vaccination record, or a photo of your card will work. Medical and religious exemptions will not be granted. We have some upcoming programs I would like to share with you. We have resumed our monthly beach cleanups on the first Saturday of every month. The next one is tomorrow morning, December 4th at 9 a.m. We have also resumed our public tide pool walks. We have one tomorrow at 2.15 p.m. and one on Sunday at 3 p.m. And we also, this weekend, we have king tides. Um, which are higher than normal tides, and that will also give us some really nice low tides for visiting the tide pools. So it'd be a great time to do a tide pool walk. There's no need to sign up for these public tide pool walks. Just come on down and join us at the aquarium. And Whale Fiesta is coming up a few months, uh, in, a, in a few months, on Sunday, February 6, 2022. Get ready for a big blowout at this, at this year's Whale Fiesta, literally. Uh, thanks to Councilman Joe Buscaiano and the Port of Los Angeles, we have added a life-size pod of inflatable whales to this annual celebration. We will also have games, crafts, guest lectures, festive music, sand sculptures, and the famous duct tape whale contest. So save the date. Before we get started, I would also like to thank and acknowledge the friends of Cabrum and Aquarium for their support. We'd also like to thank all the members of the aquarium. Being a member is a great way to support our aquarium uh, while receiving special member only benefits. Your friends membership helps support the aquarium's quality education, research and outreach programs. If you would like to become a member, visit our website for details or stop by the aquarium's welcome booth. We plan to have the next lecture back on site in the John M. Olguin Auditor Auditorium at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium on Friday, February 4th, 2022. Our speaker is Rachel McPherson from the Port of Los Angeles. The title of her talk is The Port of LA, Protecting Rich Habitat in North America's Busiest Seaport. I hope you can join us for this lecture. And just a reminder, due to the vaccine mandate, we'll, we will be checking vaccine cards and IDs before you can enter the auditorium and masks will be required at all times. 
We are planning to do this lecture as a hybrid. So you can either come in person or join us by Zoom. We will add the details to our website soon. The upcoming schedule on speakers for 2022 will be posted on our website. There's a link on the homepage under New Splash called Discovery Lecture Series, and that will take you to the upcoming schedule. If you missed any past lectures, they were all recorded and are archived on our website. On the Discovery Lecture Series page to scroll down to Lecture Archives 2014 to 2021, or you can go to the CMA YouTube page. If you are interested in the upcoming Friday, uh, February lecture, again, we are planning this lecture to be hybrid. It will be in person on site at Cabrillo, but we will also have an online option. Okay, at this time, I'm going to ask our speaker, Mara, to share her screen. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Mara Hart. Dr. Hart is a marine scientist and storyteller. She received her PhD in marine science from Scripps and her undergraduate degree in history of science from Harvard University. She lives on the Big Island in Hawaii where she spends as much time in the sea as possible. Tonight, she will present highlights from her popular science book, Sex in the Sea, our intimate connection with sex changing fish, romantic lobsters, kinky squid, and other salty erotic of the deep. Her book is also for sale at the Aquarium Gift Shop. Mara works at the crossroads of research, strategy, and creative communication. As founder of Ocean Inc., Mara has worked with teams investigating coral reef health, the impacts of climate change on marine life, and fishing impacts to ocean ecosystems. She is currently director of discovery at the nonprofit Future of Fish, working with innovators to build a more sustainable seafood industry. So let's talk about sex and sustainability of the sea. The title of tonight's talk, Sex in the Sea, It's Weirder Than You Think and Why That Matters. Thank you and we welcome Dr. Mara Hart. Uh, thank you, Julie, and thank you to the Cabrillo Aquarium for inviting me and to all of you for joining in on this Friday night, as we say in Hawaii, happy Aloha Friday. And um, I'm very excited to, to share with you about what is one of my favorite subjects which is uh, all the weird and wild ways animals reproduce in the ocean. So as we go through, um, I will have a couple questions. So as Julie mentioned, when um, I ask those questions, when we get to that part, feel free to write those answers into the chat um, and I will be able to see, see those answers and hopefully we'll, we'll keep things kind of lively and dynamic as we can. And then of course, more questions at the end. Okay, so first part, there's a lot we could talk about when it comes to oceans, especially ocean conservation. So why should we spend the next 40, 45 minutes together talking about how animals reproduce? What's, what's so interesting about this? Why do we wanna focus on sex? Well, there's two big reasons. The first is sex is the driver for all of the biodiversity that we see in the world. And this includes in the oceans, which are incredibly diverse. Each of you is like a snowflake. You are unique in your genetic identity. And that comes from the combination from your mom's DNA and your dad's DNA mixing together in a wholly new blueprint for the first time ever. And over millions of years, this is what creates all of this incredible flora and fauna that we see in the ocean. So sex is really important for this diversity, which then is really important for providing lots of different functions. So see the oceans, sex is what creates all the abundance that we rely on for things like food. And today over 3 billion people in the world rely on seafood as their primary source of protein. And the seafood industry employs, especially small scale fisheries, over 120 million workers who depend on that wild capture. That takes a lot of fish. The diversity of the oceans also creates an untold number of medicine, medicinal resources. Right now we have different trials for cancer fighting compounds, neurological disorders, Parkinson disease, heart disease, that are all come from compounds derived from animals and plants in the ocean. And of course, the abundance of 
corals, the abundance of oysters are what create these giant reefs, huge kelp forests that allow us to have coastlines that are defended against large waves and storms. For many of us, the oceans and all of that beautiful biodiversity is also just something we love to enjoy for recreation or for our cultural heritage. And all of that depends on the fish and shrimp and corals and whales of today being able to make fish and shrimp and corals and whales of tomorrow. And that depends on sex. So sex matters, but in the oceans in particular, it's really hard to study. <laughs> and in the past, we've actually gotten it kind of wrong. I'm gonna tell you a story. This is an octopus known as the Argonaut or the paper nautilus. And it's a really unique type of octopus because it actually lives in the open ocean near the surface of the waters rather than on the seafloor. And what you see here is the female and she can grow to be about a foot in length. And the males are actually tiny little dwarf species that are less than, less than an inch, sometimes less than half an inch. And in octopus, we know that females tend to be pretty aggressive. And so even when a male and female are the same size, uh, the female can attack and sometimes eat her, her pursuer. <laughs> so here you have in the Argonaut, this tiny little male who has to somehow find a female in all that open blue and then figure out how to mate with her without being eaten. So what does he do? Well, turns out that all octopus have, the males have a specialized tentacle you know, that um, has a, a space where they can carry a packet of sperm. So normally a male will reach out, tap the female and kind of deposit the sperm onto her body. In the Argonaut, the male has figured out how he, he can actually amputate, self amputate that tentacle. And it then swims its way sort of the last few meters to the female and latches on and he can stay um, free and away from her. So it's actually um, <laughs> a really great mechanism for reproduction that incorporates social distancing in our time of COVID. But when scientists first started to study this species and they found mostly the females because the males are so hard to, hard to find because they're so small, they saw this kind of worm-like thing and they thought it was a parasite. So they actually gave it its own classification known as the Hectocotylus. It was its own genus of species. It wasn't until decades later that they realized that this was actually the penis arm of the male. And so today we still call that specialized penis arm of octopus males a Hectocotylus for this reason. It took us a while to figure out that this, this was the strategy that was going on. Because again, you don't see this kind of thing on land, right? This doesn't happen <laughs> outside of the sea. The good news, though, is that today we have so many more tools and technologies that are available from genetics to underwater ROVs that are giving us much more information and more visibility into marine life and includes some of these more um, difficult to study behaviors and practices like reproduction. So today I'm going to share with you some of my favorite stories of how animals reproduce in the ocean and how we actually are impacting some of those behaviors and what that means for the future of sustainable seas. Okay, so here's the first question. Again, feel free to use the chat box. I'm gonna pull mine up now so I can see. You know, we know that sex eventually happens. So my question to you is, what are the three steps to successful sex in the sea? And I'll give you a hint, which is that sex, actual reproduction is the final step. But there's two things that need to happen beforehand. And these are things that have to happen no matter whether you're a fish or a koala or a person. So take a moment and put into the chat box what you think. Here we go. All right, we've got already right out of the gate, Elliot with find a mate and attract your mate, attraction, ability from Karen. You guys are spot on, smart crowd, that is right. When, especially when it comes to the ocean, you first gotta, you've gotta search, right? You've gotta find that mate. Then you have to convince that individual that you are the one that they should be uh, kind of going forward with. 
and then you can actually seal the deal. So you've got search, seduction, and then the final act of sex. So we'll start with act one, a story about the search. And just as a reminder, um, I live in Hawaii, which is at the top of the globe here in this shot. The oceans are a really big place. It is tough to find a date <laughs> across all that blue. We often think of the three quarters, you know, 75% of the Earth's surface being covered by ocean. But when you think about the volume, it's actually almost 99% of the livable habitat of the planet, right? We Animals in the sea need to search not just in the two dimensions like we do, forward, back, left, right. They've got to search up and down as well. So it's a lot of area to cover. So one of the main ways that animals find each other and communicate, including for reproduction, is using sound because sound travels very far through water, much farther than through air. And so this is a great way for animals to reach each other over long distances. So I'm going to now play for you a sound produced by a male that is trying to reach out to a female. And I'm going to see, I want you all to see if you can guess, and again, you can use the chat, who, who this this uh, suitor is, what kind of animal. Here we go. Hopefully you can all hear that humming. It's sort of like, some people say it sounds like a drone um, or a little air, like an airplane engine. Any guesses on who that might be? That little squid. Oh, sorry, Mary, that you can't hear it. It's uh, I, I would, I can't make, I can't reproduce it myself. <laughs> it's a low droning kind of sound, a low hum. All right, so who is it that's singing that love song? It's this guy. This is the plain fin midshipman fish. And they normally live in rather deep waters off of the Pacific Northwest. But in the springtime, the males come into the shallows and they actually build rocky nests right near the coast. And then they create this hum, this really loud, low kind of drumming sound with which to attract the females. And what's so fascinating about this is that the females are living in the deeper water as the males go up to the shallows. And it's quite some distance. And as the females begin to ovulate, so as their eggs ripen and they're preparing to lay their eggs, those same hormone cues not only trigger transitions in their egg production, it actually affects their hearing and it allows them to hone in on just the right frequency that the males are singing at. And the males are, this low sound then can be heard by the females and they can follow it into the shallows. So that's kind of fascinating to start with. Then once the female chooses her, her male and you know, likes his nest, likes his humming, she'll deposit her eggs, and then she leaves, her job's done. And so rather than having to continue to listen to this humming, her hormones having released those eggs, that chemical signaling now reconnects with her hearing and turns off the sound. So she can actually tune out the males and swim in peaceful silence back to her deeper water habitat. So this is a very finely tuned mechanism that relies on chemical changes within the female and sound production within the male to coordinate this mating and sexual behavior reproduction over these large distances from the deep depths to the shallows. And the males, just to give you a sense, the males can sing so loudly that in the spring, the Seattle Police Department often get um, calls by the public of disturbance of the peace, this no that there's this loud noise that somebody's making. And it took them a long time before they figured out that these are actually the male um, fish humming right around the harbors where the sound then gets echoed by the holes of all the boats. So it is, it can be quite, quite loud. All right, so sound is really important in the sea. Animals use it for communication, for reproduction. And of course, over the last few years, we've actually made the, actually last few decades, we've made the oceans much louder, much noisier. 
whether it's ship traffic, oil and gas exploration, naval exercises, all of these things have created a cacophony that actually are reducing the ability of animals to use sound to find one another across these distances and to, to uh, communicate effectively, sort of like shrinking the dating pool, right? Because they can only now communicate in a much smaller radius. So this is something we're working to solve. It is a challenge. But the good news about noise pollution, unlike things such as plastic pollution or oil pollution, is that when you turn the noise off, it's off, right? It just immediately goes away. So we are working on strategies where we're trying to create um, uh, innovators are trying to create engines that are quieter. And we're also trying to work with different industry, military, to figure out when and how we can space some of these noise-making activities so that they don't interrupt especially reproductive activity. We're also learning how to use sound to help protect these species. This is the North Atlantic right whale. It is one of the most endangered species on the planet. There's about 300 or so left in the wild. And one of the major threats to them are ship strikes because they happen to migrate, especially during the mating season, right through um, the northeastern seaboard where the Boston uh, port is. And so there's a ton of boat traffic coming in and out. And they tend to get hit by these boats. So what scientists have started to do is they've created um, underwater listening stations using hydrophones. And these stations can listen to sounds produced in a certain radius. And if a whale song is detected, those hydrophones can kind of beam the signal to researchers up at the Cornell um, lab in New York State, and they analyze the signature. They look at the pattern of the sound, and they can determine whether or not it is indeed a right whale singing. If it is, they then have a network of captains, boat captains in the area who have signed up voluntarily to receive alerts. And they can send out an alert that says, hey, we've picked up a signal from a right whale. It's in this vicinity. And then those captains can choose to slow down their boats and post watches. And since this process has been put into place, they actually have seen quite a drop off in the number of ship strikes, which is not only wonderful, of course, for the whales, but it is actually beneficial for, for the industry too, because hitting these whales not only is, is awful, but it, it does damage these boats. These are big animals and it slows down their um, ability to, to deliver their goods. So this is one of these cases where we're working with sound, understanding the way these animals behave and are using sound to try to figure out how we can change our own behaviors so that we're not interrupting these acts and not causing harm. Okay. So that's a little bit about the search. Now we have the seduction. Lobsters do not always look very romantic <laughs> or that kinky, but I assure you they are both, especially Maine lobsters. During mating season, female lobsters need to find and mate with the best males. But these also tend to be the most aggressive males and the best time for her to mate happens to be right after she's molted, when she's lost her hard shell. This is because at the base of her tail, she has a small pouch where she can store sperm. And when she molts, that, that pouch gets discarded and she has a fresh new pouch and she wants to fill it up completely in one mating so she can then go off and fertilize multiple batches of eggs and not have to worry about mating again. Males also want to mate with recently molted females because they want to be able to deposit their sperm in a female's pouch that's fresh and clean so that they're not having their sperm have to mix with other males where there can be sperm competition and a reduction in the, in the number of um, eggs that they actually wind up fertilizing. So what's a female to do? She's in this predicament. She needs to approach the most aggressive males in her most vulnerable state, right, as a soft-bodied animal. So she uses a love potion. Chemical cues are very important communication in the sea. And for lobsters, that chemical cue comes in the form of her urine. So it is a love potion made of her pee. And here's what happens. Conveniently, lobsters bladders actually sit just above their brains and they have two little nozzles right below their eye stalks where they can actually shoot their pee forward. 
So the female during mating season will approach the male's den and she sort of will peek in. And as he comes rushing out to defend his territory, she'll squirt him in the face with a urine and then she'll swim out of there as fast as she can. And she'll repeat this behavior over four or five days in a row. And in that amount of time, the chemical signals from her urine actually start to have a transformative effect over the male and turn him from an aggressive to a gentle lover, all the way to the point where around day five, he actually invites her to come live with him in his den. So the two of them will then move in together. They live together for a couple of days. They eat, they sleep, they do their lobster thing. And then when she feels that the molt, her molt is imminent, she goes around and faces him. And again, they sort of spray each other with this urine, to sort of cement their bond. And then they go through this really interesting ritual where he sort of bows down in front of her and she rises up and using one of her giant claws, she'll tap him on one shoulder and then the other. And this is known and we call it knighting. And we believe it's the signal that she's giving to the male, don't go away, all of this is about to happen now. She then goes to the back of the den and takes a few hours to slip out of her shell and, and go through the molting process. All the while, he actually stands guard over her and he'll sort of stroke her with his antenna and his little walking legs. And he's sort of just kind of there watching and waiting. She finishes the molt. He then is given a signal by her that it's time. She cannot stand now. She can't support her own body weight. So he now goes over and bracing himself with his tail in the sand and his two big front claws, he actually scoops her up in his walking legs and sort of forms a hammock. He'll roll her onto her back and then he'll pull her into him and they actually mate in the missionary position. He has two specialized little um, kind of levers at the base of his tail that he can insert into that pouch and deposit his sperm. The actual sex act takes just a few seconds. He then lays her back down onto the seafloor and then he will guard the entrance of the cave for the next several days while her new shell hardens. So she receives protection from him during this time. Once her shell is hardened, she feels good, time's up. She leaves the den, they probably never see each other again. And then the next female will approach and start to spray him in the face with her urine and the whole cycle starts again in what is known as a, a serial monogamy. And that's the way that Maine lobsters mate. And it all depends on chemistry. And as we know, with climate change, humans have put so much carbon dioxide through burning fossil fuels into the atmosphere that the oceans have had to absorb much of that CO2. And that carbon dioxide gas, that CO2, when it mixes with seawater, it makes the oceans more acidic. It's changing the fundamental chemistry of the ocean water. And we don't yet know how much this is going to impact the ability of animals like lobsters to communicate using chemical cues. So for this cue to work, for this messaging to work, the female's urine has to travel through the seawater and carry that signal. That could be interrupted if the seawater's chemistry changes. And the male lobster has to have receptors that can receive and interpret that signal. And those receptors can be damaged if the seawater chemistry changes. So there's two different ways that we may be disrupting this. And we are starting to see changes in animal behavior at elevated ocean acidification levels in experiments. So again, this is something that we don't tend to think about because we don't rely on chemical cues quite as much as, as lobsters do. But imagine what would happen if her love potion were to fail. These are the kinds of subtle but really significant impacts we may be having on the love lives of marine life without realizing it, all because of the way they reproduce. Okay, so we've talked about the search, we've talked about the seduction, and now let's talk a little bit about sex. We'll start with an animal that's more or less familiar, a whale. These are mammals, so they reproduce similar to how we do. Females have a vagina, males have a penis, there's insertion and the sperm is deposited inside the female where eggs are fertilized and then the mother grows those um, babies inside for live birth. Okay, however, 
In most mammals, female bodies, the vagina is structured to be a straight tunnel to make it easy, right? For the sperm to go from entrance all the way to egg. In some whales and dolphins, we see something completely different. The vaginas actually look more like this. There are flaps and folds and twists and turns and blind alleys and trap doors and pretty much an obstacle course standing between the sperm at the beginning and where the egg is. The question is why, right? Evolution doesn't just do things on a whim. It's actually energetically expensive to build all those structures. This is a finding that is very recent, it's only been in the last few years that researchers have started to discover and try to untangle and solve this mystery. Here's what we know to date, a couple of working hypotheses. Where we see these more intricate structures, it happens in species where females have very little control over who is mating with them. So these are social structures where males are, multiple males are mating with females in quick succession. So we think that these structures may help a female be able to screen or filter after sex has happened. She can't really control who's mating with her prior, but after copulation, her body may be able to, through say muscular contraction, close down certain pathways and shunt the sperm. Through chemical secretions that are released in these more complicated structures, she may be able to favor certain sperm over another, or it may just be the case that only the most tenacious fit sperm can actually make it through this gauntlet. And that's a way that she's filtering. We don't yet know, but in species where females, where there's a lot of male competition and males fight and compete for access to female and only one or two males are competing, we see that the female vaginas are much more simple in structure. So this is the working hypothesis at this time, and it's fascinating. And it opens up a whole new area of research that is known as cryptic female choice. This is a reproductive strategy, cryptic meaning hidden. And it's something that we're now seeing in sharks, whales, and also some insects that are lending us to think that actually females may have much more control over who is actually fertilizing their eggs, over the fate, the genetic fate of their offspring, then may be apparent from just watching and thinking about the initial social structures and the initial behavior that we see. There may be things happening on the inside that are lending females some advantage. And we are now starting to uh, look into this in a lot more detail. Okay, but really in the ocean, mammals are kind of rare, right? Most things, in the, most life is not a mammal lifestyle. And when it comes to sex, many species in the sea don't just go by male and female. Things get far more complicated when it comes to how animals reproduce and who is playing which role in the ocean. Because we have in the sea something known as sex change. So this is where a species can one animal, one individual may start life as one type of uh, reproductive strategy, a female producing eggs. And then later in life, they can transition into a male and start to produce sperm. Or it can go the other way around. They can start as male and then sex change into a female. And there's all different reasons why animals have one or the other strategy. But what is fascinating is that there are lots of animals. In fact, I bet many of you, if you eat seafood, have eaten species that are sex changers, that are what are known as sequential hermaphrodites, from one sex at one part of their life cycle to another sex at the other. Oysters do it, shrimp do it. And now for your next question, what famous cartoon fish also changes sex? So put it into the chat box. Sheephead, yep, they do, great answer. And all right, Laura, quick out of the gate with Nemo, that's right. So spoiler alert, <laughs> which is that Pixar got this really, really wrong, <laughs> but probably because it helps make things a little more G-rated for, for their crowd. 
But in the case of clownfish, this is a species where all individuals are actually born male. And later in life, they transition into female. And here's how it works. Within an anemone, where these clownfish live, they live in a, a groups of a, cup, a couple, maybe five, six, seven clownfish in one, one anemone. And then there's a dominant couple, one male and one female. All the other fish are juveniles. The female is the biggest. And she wants to make sure that that one male is fertilizing just her eggs and isn't sneaking off anywhere or getting distracted. So she bonds closely with him and sort of a little bit aggressively kind of intimidates him a bit, which helps keep him to a smaller size, right? He actually stunts his growth a little bit. That male in turn wants to make sure the female is only having her eggs fertilized by him. So he sort of bullies all these other clownfish in the anemone to keep them small and actually prevent them from maturing into fully mature males. So they're sort of in this suspended juvenile state. And it keeps sort of this pecking order that's controlled by size. And the two top biggest fish, the male and the female, mate. Then if the female gets eaten, like in Nemo, or dies, that large male can very quickly transition into a female. And then the next biggest fish in line will mature as a male and that couple will start to reproduce. So it allows the fish to control their reproduction within the confines of an anemone so they don't have to stray out and risk predation, but also are able to control who, who they're mating with. And so the real story with Nemo, if you put this all together, is that when Nemo's mom, Coral, died, his dad, Marlin, would have actually transitioned into Marlene and Nemo would have mated with his father turned mother, which is probably why Pixar took a little creative license and didn't do the straight up natural history version of this story. But it's fascinating and it works to maximize the reproductive output. It helps these, these uh, species to produce the most offspring that they can within that mating strategy. And again, other species that have different kinds of mating strategies, the transition goes the reverse. So sheep's head that was mentioned here, they um, have more of a harem lifestyle where big males have to compete for females. And so they actually are born as females and later transition into males. I believe I have that correct. Um, somebody shout out if that's wrong. This is also what parrotfish do. So it's in that wrasse family. And what that means is that as a small female, they can successfully meet with a larger male, but then when they're big enough, they can transition and sort of take on a harem or fight for a harem of their own with other large males. And so there's trade-offs and they all work to maximize that reproductive output. Well, what this means is that for species that sex change, we often, when we do go and fish in the ocean, Fishers often have rules and regulations around not catching the smallest fish, right? Allowing baby fish to grow and reproduce. But it means that they tend to target the biggest fish. And in a sex changing species, that might mean that fishers are taking out all the males or all the females. So even though we might be leaving the right number of fish in the water, we've skewed the sex ratio. And that can really have major consequences for the ability of that species to be reproducing. So this is a situation where we really need more knowledge, right? We need to know what these behaviors are and what these mating strategies are so that we can adjust our management and we know what to do. Today, there's many folks who are talking about putting maximum size limits in place in cases where we have a sex changing species that's being targeted. But we have to have the science and have to have the research to know that that's indeed a sex changer in order to be able to put those best practices forward. So the science of sex is in the sea and the application of it is really important for the future of fish. But not all fish sex change and not all fish mate in small couples like clownfish. In fact, in the ocean, one of the most common ways for animals to reproduce is actually through giant group sex. And this is because again, releasing many of these species release their sperm and eggs into the open blue. And if you are releasing your very valuable 
very intense, you know, precious sperm and eggs into a huge, vast ocean, you want to make sure that there's other sperm and eggs nearby, right? For that to mix with. So by getting together in large groups, animals are able to overcome some of this um, issue with their sperm and eggs kind of flying off <laughs> into, into the currents. And what you see here on the screen are a picture of Nassau grouper. This is an endangered species in the Caribbean. It's a very tasty species that over the past few decades has unfortunately be, been very heavily overfished and it is now protected in many places, including in the Cayman Islands, where one of the last major spawning aggregations occur. And so what happens, excuse me for just a quick sec. Okay, so what happens is in the Nassau grouper, these fish live solo for most of the year. They're independent. In fact, they're quite territorial and aggressive. But with the full moon rising in January, so starting next month, as the water temperatures cool, they sort of start to feel this shift. And they'll swim out to the edge of the reef and they sort of hover there. And then they start to form these huge caravans that travel from the outside of these small islands, these atolls, down to one point in the south. And they aggregate in massive numbers. In the past, we think these aggregations reached hundreds of thousands of fish. Today, there's very few places that even have hundreds of fish. In the Cayman Islands several years ago, these species were discovered and there was about seven to 8,000 fish. Within about three years of discovery, fishers had fished down that spawning aggregation to just two to 3,000. This is when scientists and conservationists brought it to the attention of government and to fishers saying, hey, we're about to lose this spawning aggregation. Over half of these fish were taken in just a few years. So they embarked on an initiative where scientists pushed and conservationists and some fishers to close fishing on this spawning aggregation. And this allowed the fish to spawn, to actually go through their reproductive behavior without having to worry about fishers coming in and taking them out of the water. And scientists were able to study this. And what they saw was that as that full moon came into its peak about two or three days after, these large aggregations, the fish would start to shift their behavior. They would take on this color patterning that you can see here, this dark on the top, light on the bottom. And the females just around sunset, just around dusk, would all of a sudden start to shoot up into the water column and do this beautiful arc. And all these males would follow her and release their sperm as she released their eggs at the top. And you'd see these geysers of pockets of these, these groupers kind of going up, these grouper geysers going up and releasing their sperm and egg into the water over and over and over again for about an hour after sunset. And then all of that activity would quiet down and they'd sort of hang out and they'd sort of sit together again for the, until the next night. And they did it for three or four nights in a row. And I have a video here to show you just what this looks like. So you're going to see two fish on the right side of this screen. And on the left side of the screen, you'll see some activity start to begin. And I know it's dark, but here they go. They go up, 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 and poof. And within a few minutes, the visibility in the water goes from 100 feet to almost nothing where you can barely see your hand in front of your face because there's so much sperm and egg being released. So scientists and researchers with the um, project REEF, uh, the Reef Education and Restoration Foundation, have been studying this for a long time, researchers out of Scripps as well. And during this eight-year closure that the government agreed to, they were able to document an increase in the number of fish, larger fish starting to come back to the spawning aggregation, new fish recruiting in. And because of the success of the closure, because the growth of the population has been such, the Cayman Islands decided just back, I think it was in 2016, 17, to make the closure permanent. And the fishers have supported this permanent closure. And again, it's a spawning closure during spawning season 
because at the rest of the time of the year, they're now catching more fish. So it's an example of this win-win by saying, hey, let's let all of these animals reproduce while they're in this tight window of just a few days over a few months. Then the rest of the time, there's going to be more fish in the sea for all of us to enjoy as divers and as seafood lovers. So we need to expand these types of spawning aggregation protections in the ocean as one of the main ways that we can conserve and help protect fish species because many different species do this, whether it's snapper, grouper, some of our most um, prized seafood fish are ones that spawn in these aggregations. So we're looking to try to push for protections of these spawning aggregations in the places where they occur for that reason. Now, I know we're getting close on time, but I wanna leave with one last example. This is a beautiful coral reef and corals are where my love affair with Sex in the Sea first started. And when we think about reproduction in the ocean, and we talked about these mating strategies of fish getting together in these groups, that's all great because fish can move. But what happens when you're a coral? Corals are animals that are stuck to the bottom, but they also release their sperm and eggs into the ocean. How do you overcome those sperm and eggs just flying off into nowhere when you can't actually get together to have sex? all comes down to some very impeccable timing. So here's what's happened. And what you're looking at on the screen is a close-up of a coral colony. So each of these circles is an individual polyp. And at the center of that polyp, you're seeing a small egg sperm bundle. Many of the reef building corals, the ones that make those beautiful structures that we think of as coral reefs are hermaphrodites. So they are male and females at the same time. So these bundles actually include sperm and eggs. But a coral doesn't want to fertilize itself. It doesn't want to self-fertilize. It wants to mix, again, for that genetic diversity to create that biodiversity that we were talking about earlier. It wants to reproduce by having its sperm mixed with eggs from another coral and its eggs get fertilized by sperm from another coral. So to do this, corals synchronize their mass spawn. And some of you may have heard of this, or even I believe a year ago, um, the Great Barrier Reef broadcast a live feed of the mass spawn from their reef. So I encourage you to check that out because it might be coming up soon now. Corals, as the temperatures warm in the summer months, that's the first cue that they get that it may be time to start to get ready to reproduce. The next cue is the moon phase. So again, the light of the full moon triggers in the species that it's starting to become a narrow window of spawning. So many species will spawn during the warmest months, three to five or seven days after the full moon. Then the next signal comes down to sunset, the day of the spawn. So if it's a species that's going to spawn five days after the full moon in say August in the Caribbean, on that fifth night, as the sun sets, the coral, with that darkness, the coral gets triggered. It's like a clock, a countdown clock begins to tick. And this countdown clock is so precise that year after year, the same exact coral colony will release its sperm and eggs within one to two minutes of the same time that it did after sunset the year before. So if a, a coral spawned 90 minutes after sunset, say sunset was at six o'clock and it spermed at 7.30 at night in 2020, this year you would expect that same coral to spawn sometime between 7.28 and 7.32. It's that precise. You can set your watch to them, which is fascinating and pretty remarkable given that these coral animals don't really have what we consider a complex brain structure. They have a simple neural ring. We can't get our timing that good, let's be honest. So corals are doing this across millions of individuals over miles and miles of reef. And what's amazing about this is that different species coordinate different timing. So one species, boulder corals will go at 7.30 and then star corals will go at nine o'clock. And all of this staggering and precise timing helps ensure 
not only that each species can connect and reproduce with other members of its species, but that they don't mix with the wrong species and create hybrids, which actually can be fatal and result in offspring that don't develop properly. So it's a fascinating system and underwater it is truly magical. And I encourage any of you, you don't have to be a scuba diver, you can just snorkel on a tropical reef and see this happening during the summer months. And I'll show you now a video just to show what it looks like. What you're seeing here is when that countdown clock hits zero, the mouth of the polyp opens and that small sperm egg bundle is released and it lifts and floats up. The eggs have a lot of fat and oil in them. So they rise like tiny balloons to the surface and it creates almost like this underwater blizzard. And at first it's really peaceful and it's, it's this really ethereal kind of show. And then after a few minutes, <laughs> it starts to get kind of chaotic because you have worms and fish and all these things coming in and trying to eat all those eggs. And that's another reason why they synchronize this spawn is by putting so many sperm and eggs into the water, they sort of flood the buffet for all the predators that are there. And a few, a small fraction of sperm and egg actually make it to the surface, break apart, and are able to mix and create fertilized larvae. Those larvae will live in the surface of the waters for a few days, for a few weeks, and then settle down to start to grow the next and new coral colony. So all of this for corals um, has been working for millennia, but today corals are really struggling. This strategy that has worked so well for so long is now starting to fail. And one of the reasons for it is because of this dependency on timing and that the timing is orchestrated across near neighbors, right, on a coral reef. So corals, when they release, there is some ability for those sperm and eggs to travel, but they need to make sure that other colonies nearby are also releasing. And because mostly of climate change, we are losing our coral uh, reefs, right? They are bleaching, which is due to too, warm waters getting um, too hot and corals stressing, creating a bleaching response that then often will kill the colony. But overfishing and other types, types of pollution have also really had an impact on coral reefs. And what this means is that there are not only fewer adults left to spawn, so there's fewer sperm and eggs going into the water, but the sperm and eggs that are being released, those adults are farther apart. This creates a huge challenge. The timing of that release is getting thrown off. They're not able to sense those same cues and the sperm and eggs aren't able to mix in the same way. So it's sort of like a double whammy that's hitting these coral reefs because of their unique reproductive strategy. When we think about it, an analogy for people is that when we reproduce, whether we are in a remote, tiny little village or a campsite where we're the only couple there, or we're in the middle of a, an apartment building in New York City surrounded by millions of people, that doesn't affect our ability to conceive and reproduce. But it does when it comes to many species in the sea, not just corals. This distance issue was also something that has led to the huge declines in abalone, which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with having um, off the California coasts. So what can we do about it, right? How, how can we change this? Well, first, we need to learn more. We need to understand and appreciate that sex happens differently in the oceans. And so we need to be precautionary and think about what are the ways in which this species might be reproducing and how might we manage differently and adjust our behaviors so that we can support rather than thwart sexual activity. One of the things that we're doing is we're working with corals to help actually grow and farm coral colonies to try to boost their ability to connect. Putting more colonies out on damaged reefs helps to increase the, and sorry, decrease the distance between those adults. So coral farming is a new strategy that has been developed and there's some amazing science that is actually helping to understand and increase fertilization rates in corals, like IVF for corals are happening now. We also can harvest our seafood differently. 
And we can look at practices that, again, respect and abide by the reproductive strategies, leaving species to spawn during their spawning periods and taking only what is what is what's needed and only what the science tells us is necessary in order to keep the populations at the right levels. This is a picture of a fisher that we work with um, through my work at Future of Fish. This is in Belize, and he's harvesting this lobster using a noose and free diving. What this means is that he can actually look to see whether or not this is a female, whether or not she's carrying eggs, whether or not she's close to molting, and decide, and, and also if she's the right size, and decide whether or not to take that animal before he's actually done any real damage to it. So these kind of techniques, these small scale fisheries and new kinds of management can really help us here. What else can you do uh, to help protect sex in the sea? There's a couple of things. You can look for sex friendly seafood. So what do we mean by sex friendly, sex -friendly seafood? Well, this are, these are species that are, tend to be lower on the food chain, and that reproduce in large numbers so that they can actually withstand a bit of fishing pressure. Shellfish are a great example. Oysters, mussels, clams, as are um, species, small fish species like um, anchovies or sardines or mackerel. These can all, because they reproduce so quickly and in such high numbers with, a pro with best practice for management, which in the US we have really good strong fisheries management, with those practices in place, we can ensure that those fish are able to reproduce and we're only taking out the amount that's, that's required for sustainable seafood. So look for those species lower on the food chain. The other thing we can do, and we heard this from Nemo, right? All drains go to the ocean. This means what we use on our lawns, what we use to clean our homes, and what we use to clean our bodies matters. All of those chemicals that are out there in many of our cleaning products actually can disrupt some of that chemical signaling that we know is so important for things like sex changing species. So try to look for all natural products and really pay attention to what it is that you're using. It's healthier for you and your families, as well as healthier for the oceans. All right, plastics. This is a big topic. We could definitely have a whole lecture on this, um, but many plastics actually, again, accumulate toxins and can actually release chemicals into the ocean that can disrupt hormone cues and mess with chemical signaling of animals, as well as of course being physical harm, bringing physical harm right through entanglement and things. So the more that we can reduce our reliance on plastics, especially, you know, I'll have you all think it is the holidays. Many of us are trying to think of um, gifts for our loved ones. Try to look for things that do not require single use plastics or plastics in general. Look for things that are recycled, made from natural materials, and just keep that in mind as we move forward in our everyday consumption. Perhaps most important, vote for science and act on climate. There are major climate legislation and other kinds of bills coming forward right now for our country in the US and elsewhere. We need to make sure that we are voting for representatives who, and leaders who respect and apply science for evidence-based decision-making and that we are acting on climate now. We don't have any more time. And climate change through warming seas and ocean acidification, as well as rising sea levels, is one of the greatest threats to the future health of our oceans, including successful reproduction in the sea. So there's a lot that we can do. And I wanna leave you with a final story, a story that gives me hope. This is a small tooth sawfish. It's an endangered species that lives off of um, the Gulf Coast. And several years ago, researchers were tagging a female um, in the hopes to try to understand a, a bit more about their behavior, where they were going. And this female, you can see in the upper right uh, picture here, this female, when she was on her back, they realized that she was actually pregnant she began to give birth on the line. And you can just see here this small little snout poking out of, of the female's cloaca, which is the equivalent in a shark of a vagina. And in the bottom frame, you can see this tiny, perfect little, little sawfish. So this was the first time that scientists were able to witness this event. And it also gave them the chance to sample tissue from the babies, the pups, as well as the mom. 
what they were looking for was to try to see, was this mom mating with multiple males or was she just mating with a single male? Because she has multiple pups. They had litters of about eight to 10. And they wanted to know if she's like other shark species, sharks and rays, where there's multiple males that she's mating with or not, especially given how endangered the species is. When they ran the genetics, they came up with a very interesting finding. These little baby shark pups had no dads. There was no male contribution to the DNA. This female had undergone something known as parthenogenesis. It's virgin birth, where her egg is able to split and then reform with itself to create a viable embryo that can grow into an offspring and a healthy shark. This is a very rare but fascinating process that we now have documented in multiple shark species. It also exists actually in some lizards. And we do believe it's a stress response. We tend to see it in individuals where a female has had limited access to males, can't find males. And so rather than not reproducing at all, she undergoes this process. The good news is that this means there is reproduction happening. She is making more of the same species and these are not clones. They are genetically distinct from the mom, but because they're made just from the mom's gen um, genes, from her DNA recombining, they're not as genetically diverse as what we would see if two different individuals, if a male and a female were able to combine. So the good news is it buys us some time for endangered species, it means these females may still be reproducing even if they can't find a mate. But we still need to do our part to protect these species and get their numbers up so that regular reproduction can happen between males and females. But I tell you this story because it shows that nature is on our side here, right? Nature wants to reproduce. Animals go to great extremes, sometimes leaving the water Get going up on the sand, right, in order to create the next generation. And this, it means that even in spite of all of the threats and all of the hardships that we have created, they are still spawning on, right? They are still going through their own reproductive behaviors. The corals in the Great Barrier Reef right now are preparing for that annual mass spawn. The NASA group are right now are starting to get together. That full moon in December is coming up soon. They are doing their part. So all we need to do is ours. And we know what to do. We know what good management looks like. We know what best practice is in terms of reducing our impact on the oceans. So together with greater knowledge, with better science, I really do think we can turn this tide and help support these sexual activities and create an environment where animals can reproduce as they have for millennia to produce that bounty and all of that diversity that fuels all of us. So I thank you for listening. I'm excited to answer any questions. I want to acknowledge all of the incredible researchers whose tireless efforts and extraordinary capacity goes into bringing us these stories and understanding these systems in detail. And I am happy to open the floor, pass it back to you, Julie, to take questions. So um, to all, all of our viewers out there, if, um, if you have some questions, um, put them in the Q&A uh, part of, the, of your toolbar at the bottom rather than the chat, because um, it's easy, easier for me to click when it's been answered and then we can go through them and um, a little bit easier and they won't get overlooked in the chat. Um, but I, I will say, I, I read something in the chat about one of our, our members from the aquarium and she said, this is the best sex in the sea ever. <laughs> thank you so much. You're a great storyteller. Um, uh, so you. yeah, there's a lot of really nice comments um, coming in, but please everyone, if you would put, the, put your questions in the, in the Q and A. Um, I, I have a question um, for you, Mara. Yeah. Um, about the, the spawning in the, of corals and the, the distance you were talking about. Because yeah. we talk a lot about that. You're right. We talk, especially Cabrillo, we talk a lot about that with abalone in California and how the numbers have declined for, for many reasons, but one because of the way they spawn and the way that we yeah. produce that they spawn and the distance. What's 
So what's kind of the, the rule of thumb as far as the neighbor, like how yeah, far, you know, how it's, far apart? It's a great question. I know if I'm remembering correctly, and there may be some abalone experts on here, so, so jump in, but I believe that it was about a meter is where if they are farther apart than, you know, about three feet, yeah. the um, fertilization success drops like by like 50%. Like it's a big steep drop off. For corals, I don't know. I think it, it really depends. Different species, it, it seems like their sperm, it's really about how long the sperm lasts. Like how much energy do they have and how able are they to like swim around before they sort of fizzle out, right? Because they're just this tiny little packet and they only have so long to find, to find an egg. So some of it is, um, is really species dependent, but it's not big distances. You know, they can't go for tens of meters. Now, what also changes is currents, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do see sometimes as well is some species seem to trigger their spawning when the waters are calm in order to like contain the eggs and sperm. Others use tactics of spawning when it's rougher, when there's storms or stronger current flows because they actually want to spread. They want to reach further and kind of have more like downstream. So it's really species specific, but this idea of density dependence, that's kind of what it's called. Density dependent spawning is, is really critical. And it's again, something that, you know, we just, it, it, we don't see that on, on land. It, it's not a thing. And so when we were originally managing, you know, um, for different, you know, fish stocks or, or abalone and others, we were counting and we were thinking about how many animals were there, but we weren't thinking about how tightly were they packed, how close together were they. Um, and that wound up being a really big, um, really big factor. Yeah, probably for a lot of our benthic spawners, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. So we have some questions that have come in. Um, one is from Evie. Um, is that true for spiny lobsters as well? So I'm, I, she kind of wrote down at the same time as me about the serial monogamy um, yeah. that you talked about in the main lobsters. Is that, is that true for the, the California spiny lobster? You know, or I, I need to, crustacean? I need to find, so if anybody knows of some really good spiny lobster biologists, my, my answer is, I don't know. I have been asking for about four years now, trying to track down a good answer to that. Um, they ran some really detailed experiments um, on Maine lobsters. Um, a few professors actually out of um, I think it was Boston College. Uh, and so they were able to document this, this process out there. But I don't know if it applies because again, um, the fishers I work with in Belize are all wondering if they do the same thing with their spiny lobster. So I keep telling them to follow them around, figure it out, help, help us, help us understand it. But that's one of the mysteries that I haven't, I haven't heard an answer to. So I'm sorry that I can't, I can't say yes or no. Um, my sense would be that the, you know, they're similar enough that they, they do need to, to mate one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so the question just is if that kind of seduction needs to happen, like if the males are equally aggressive, if they're looking to mate after molting. And I, I just don't know with the spiny lobster. We ha have, I haven't. Have you read about it in any other crustaceans? No, no, there's different kinds of um, like crabs. And um, there's some other species that there are. Um, really interesting sort of mating behaviors and, and sort of courtships that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of that, that urine, it, and especially like pee as a potion, right? It, lobsters are one of the, the main ones, but we do know, again, like on land, urine is used to mark territory. Mammals do this, right? It's a, it's a very strong and um, carrier of signals. It can, it can show health of an animal. What's been fascinating is the researchers who were doing the work on lobster reproduction were also looking at other behaviors and they were able to identify that Maine lobsters actually have individual recognition through that urine. They can recognize a single lobster, not just that you are a lobster, but that you are Bob the lobster. And if I'm a male and I've been in a fight with Bob the lobster and Bob the lobster won, even three months later, if you put me in an arena with Bob again, I'm not going to fight him. I, I remember, and I know that that pecking order has been established and I'm just going to chill back. 
So there's some really sophisticated things happening in that species. I just don't know yet how much it translates. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Mary, Mary also has a question about the, the, the lobster mating ritual. She wanted to know if you have a video or perhaps if you, if it, if yeah. you refer to a video or you do know of a video that. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. So um, there is not, there is not footage of this that I have been able to find. And the researchers I talked to, um, they have, you know, for research purposes, they have taken video, but again, I have not been able to, to, to gain access to that. This is all done, the actual ritual itself, um, because they mate in sort of these dens, it's very difficult to see. And so what they did in the labs was they actually recreated um, lobster habitat and they were able to um, use um, sort of red lights, right, night vision to watch. They kind of had little, little holes where they could look in and see what was happening to document the behavior. And then they did go out into the wild and they would follow the lobster. They, you know, they watched how the females would return um, and kind of go and, and sort of position herself to shoot the urine at the male at the beginning. So it was sort of pieced together through field and lab experiments. But um, no footage would be fascinating. And maybe now, like there's there's so much better technology. Some of these studies were done well over 10, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, now there, there really are some, some amazing cameras that can, can look for some of these things. So yeah, maybe uh, we should shout out to uh, the folks who do Blue Planet and say, this is, this is one to document for next time. Yeah, we want to see the nighting. <laughs> yeah, right? Amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. <cool. laughs> okay, uh, Carl has a question. Are we aware of any species that have passed through a genetic bottleneck that practice cryptic female choice? So great question. I'm going to, I'm assuming Carl, that you mean that their population numbers were so small. Um, and then the females started to use cryptic female choice. So cryptic female choice is again, different, right. Than parthenogenesis. So just to be clear, those are two different things. Cryptic female choice tends to be when females don't have control over the males. And so you may be asking like, if the male pool is really limited, is she actually still trying to screen and not mate with certain males? Um, I don't know an example of that. What we tend to see is cryptic female choice in situations where females, there's a lot of males mating with them, multiple males, and they're actually trying to have some control and some selective um, ability post copulation. Right. So um, I don't know if that answers it in terms of parthenogenesis. Yes, we again, we've seen it in, in, in like the example I showed with the, the small tooth sawfish, uh, which where we think it's because their numbers are so low. But we've also seen it in things like aquarium, right, where females have been separated from males and, and don't have access. And so then they they will reproduce. Um, it's tricky because sharks in sharks, they can also store sperm. They can store sperm for like over three years. So you also have to make sure that that female wasn't mated with prior and isn't just having a pup delayed. Yeah. Whole other kind of uh, reproductive strategy. But yeah, I hope that answered your question. I, yeah, I think, I, yeah, he, I think he was talking about cryptic because it was, he wrote it before you even talked about parthenogenesis. Okay. Um, okay. Brett, um, Brett wants to know how does overfishing affect coral sustainability? That's a great question. And there are several different ways um, that that can happen. Um, so when we're just talking about coral health and um, healthy reefs in general, one of the main ways that overfishing has impacted that system is that when we fished reefs, we tend to fish sort of top down through the food web hit sort of the groupers and the snappers. Then we start to go after smaller species like grunts and the herbivores, such as parrotfish and other wrasse, uh, sorry, parrotfish and um, like rabbitfish in, in the Pacific. Those species are grazers. They are eating seaweed. They graze and help keep the reefs clean. When we fish those species out, it sort of releases the seaweed to sort of overgrow the corals. Seaweed actually can grow much faster than corals and spread very quickly and it smothers coral reefs. So by overfishing, by taking too many of those herbivorous herbivorous fish out, 
we've thrown off that balance. That's one way. Um, there are other ways. Um, some of it's just direct impacts um, by having lots of boats in the water, again, through oil pollution, um, there's uh, anchor damage, you know, ship strikes into reefs. Um, but in terms of fishing, it tends to be this um, dynamic where we've thrown off the balance that's, that's kind of unleashed seaweeds to then grow. And really today, any single impact um, is, is kind of being added up to the global, any local impact from fishing, sorry, is sort of being added to this overall stress that climate change is putting on our reef system. So we already have reefs in a weakened state. Their immune systems and their energies are going to trying to deal with these warmer water, these bleaching events, ocean acidification. And now if you add overfishing on top of it, um, it's just another sort of um, burden and, and they're really struggling to, to keep up. Um, I, I wanted to add, um, kind of ask a question about um, what everybody can do as far as, you gave a really nice example about the groupers and the, the cooperation with the government um, to, yeah. to create the closures during spawning season. And there's, that's kind of happening right now. I gotta give a plug for our California Grunion. It's oh. happening right now um, where we're bringing it to the table. We, the scientists in the community, to extend the closure and um, to add a bag limit. And people can vote, people can um, add their name to petitions so that scientists can bring as much information to the table of how important this is. But that's one example. What about other, other species? How can people get involved uh, yeah. with those kinds of things? So that's a great example. And I, and I encourage all of you, if you don't know the story of Grunion, it's like the best, it's such a cool sex in the sea story. Um, and I should have thought to have included it knowing that you guys are California based. And it's in our um, logo. It's in the, in it our, is, I know I'm seeing it and it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's, um, but it's quite risque when you think about it. So yeah. I'll leave it there. You can see it. You can read about it in the book though. It's for, for sure. Um, you know, it's tricky because again, one of the things that's so challenging is that you may have, um, two really closely related species, two kinds of grouper, and one's a sex changer and one's not. And so part of what's hard as a, as a member of the public um, is figuring out how do, I, how do I support this kind of stuff? Um, so there's a couple of things. Again, thinking about what, sh what you're eating um, is, is one of the biggest ways um, that we, we can affect um, reproductive health of the oceans, but also just health of the oceans. And in the US, despite the fact that we have amazing fish being caught right off our shore, we import 90% of the seafood we eat. 90% is not coming from US fisheries. So one of the best things that you can do, if, especially if you live locally by the coast, is go connect with a community supported fishery go to your local grocery store and ask for, for fish that is locally caught, even US-based caught. Show that we want fish from our own shores that we know are being well-managed. That is one of the best things you can do. The other thing is if you are traveling, if you're going to other locations, be aware, ask. It's an interesting way to experience your trip as a tourist and say, What's happening in the oceans right now? Is it spawning season for a certain species? Many of, this, many of these things you can look up and, and see. And, and then when you're out to eat again, think about whether or not this is, is, is it right? If I know that the NASA grouper are spawning because it's January and I heard this lecture and I'm now hanging out in Key West and there's a whole bunch of, well, that wouldn't work because they're endangered. So don't do it in the US, but say you were somewhere else and there was grouper spawning, don't eat grouper for dinner when it's spawning time. That's a lot to put on people. I, I recognize that. So again, part of, I think, the best things that we can do is to be, one, supporting in the U.S., supporting our local fish because they, we do have very, very good fisheries management. Two, support local representatives, whether it's at your city council level or your state level or, you know, the the all the way to the top that listen to scientists 
that respect scientific evidence. That's really the best thing we can do for our planet as a whole. Um, there are campaigns that are, are happening. So again, with the right whale, there's a huge new push. Um, it was just put, um, it's ranking went even lower. And so there's now changes in terms of um, some of the, um, I think it's the, the cod fishery and the tuna fisheries out there, lobster fisheries as well, because they're worried about these entanglements. So if, if you're interested in a particular species or a particular um, you know, part of, of the ocean, particular habitat, you can kind of go online and look and see if there's any conservation measures that are coming forward. Um, but really, I, I go to looking for local food, seafood, supporting local fishers, um, because we really do um, understand and have very, very good science-based management in our country. And that's something that, that we should be supporting way more um, than we do. So think about eating things besides salmon, tuna, and shrimp. There's a whole bunch of other great, great choices out there. And it would give salmon, tuna, and shrimp a little bit of a break, which would probably be good. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad you said that. Okay. Um, do you have, do you have, we still have some time for? Yeah, sure. Questions? Okay. Um, John wants to know about the clownfish. Um, on a given anemone, are, are all clownfish on a given anemone siblings? And if so, do they show any inbreeding depression? Great question. So the answer is no, they were, they're not all siblings. And, and so what you have is you'll have an anemone and juvenile clownfish after, after they hatch, right. They, the, the eggs are actually laid on the bottom and then they they'll hatch, swim around as larvae develop, and then they'll recruit back to the reef. Um, and when they settle back, they'll find an anemone. And depending on whether or not that anemone is already occupied by some clownfish or one clownfish or no clownfish, that'll determine sort of one, whether they're allowed to stay. You know, if the anemone is too crowded, they may be kicked out. Or if they recruit in and there's room, they'll, they'll likely recruit in as a juvenile if there's others there and they'll have to sort of wait their turn. But they're not necessarily related to any of the others that are there. So I hope that answered the question. I think so. Okay, um, there's, there's a couple questions about parthenogenesis and I'll just kind of loop them. One's more of a comment that it also happens in birds like California condor. I um, didn't know that. Yeah, which is recently oh. published. Whoa. Um, yep, that's Evie, one of, our, one of our staff. She's a birder and she- Oh, yeah. thanks Evie. I'll, I'll go check that out. And again, right as species that's been endangered, low numbers, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Heidi wants to know about it. Is it more common in invertebrates? You know, that's a, it's a great question. I actually don't know of it happening in invertebrates. The species that I know are sharks, lizards, now birds. So those are all vertebrates. Um, yeah, there's, there's a freshwater fish that does it too. Yeah. Like a, it's a molly. Anybody else know? Yeah. Is there any in invertebrates? Oh. Alfonso, Google it. I don't know. Yeah. It's a great question, but I don't. Yeah, I can't think of it either. It's, it's such an amazing topic. Oh it is. God. And I think part of it is because of the internal fertilization. So even though egg birds, you know, lay their eggs again, they're still internally fertilized. And I think many invertebrates don't have internal fertilization. And so I'm wondering if there's a link there. Yeah, right. That makes sense. But I don't know. Um, I'm going out on a limb. Okay. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Um, what is, what's it about? Like, I mean, obviously it's about sex and the sea, but is it, is it written as like a, a story, uh, like these different, different story, like the way you, you just um, did your lecture? Yeah, it is. So it, it is in um, four acts similar to this lecture. So we go through the different types of um, searching and finding mates. We go through lots of different ways the animals seduce one another and then lots of different kinds of sex, the way that sex happens. And then the final chapter is on this um, notion of how we can do, change our behaviors and what we can do and some of the solutions that exist, some of the innovations and new ideas that are out there um, to, to try to help create healthier, more sex-friendly seas. And it is, it's written for um, an audience, you know, not really young kids, but I'd say um, 12 and up kind of a thing. 
and it's, you know, all science based, but it's not sciencey. Um, so what I try to do is really use illustrations and I actually also use stories. So I create, I've created sort of these little vignettes that rather than anthropomorphizing, which is where we put our characteristics onto nature and animals, I do the opposite. I say, what if we reproduce the way sea urchins did? What would a ride on a subway look like if that were the case? <laughs> so I really try to make it accessible and make it fun um, and, and sort of storytell all of this amazing research that you know dozens of scientists have been working on over the last several years to understand what these behaviors look like. So um, yeah, there's pictures in there, drawings, and lots of stories, um, some, some from the first person, from my own experience um, on, on coral reefs, but most from sort of my ability to, um, my privilege to be able to talk to all these amazing scientists and, and put their work um, into the book. Awesome. I, um, I, I know we're, we're uh, if we don't have it in stock, we're getting it in the, in the gift shop, but I'm pretty sure it's there. So um, those of you that are local and, and come to the aquarium will have it for sale in the gift shop. It'd be a nice oh, Christmas thank you. gift. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't wait to read it. Um, and I just noticed uh, one of our staff, Carl, he, he just uh, chimed in about parthenogenesis, that there is at least one species of sea star that is parthenogenic, that no, no males have ever been found. Oh. And then I saw somebody else said something about walking stick insects. Okay. Um, Perhaps. Perhaps. You guys are giving me great homework. I, lo I love, that's one of my favorite things with talks is the stuff I don't know that people are asking. And then it gives me yeah. an excuse to go, go dig. Yeah. Um, I'll check out that, that sea star. Um, that's awesome. And the condor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely the condor. Yeah. Well, um, I think we'll bring it to a close tonight. Um, so I'd like to, uh, Thank, thank again our speaker, Dr. Mara Hart, and thanks again to the Friends of Cabrillo Marine Aquarium and the City of Los Angeles for their support. Um, we apologize if we haven't gotten to everybody's questions, uh, but once again, our upcoming uh, lecture will be on Friday, February 4th, 2022. Our speaker is Rachel McPherson from the Port of Los Angeles, and the title of her talk is the Port of LA Protecting Rich Habitat in North American's Busiest Seaport. Um, this lecture will be on site at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. More information can be found on the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium website. And a reminder, we have recorded this lecture and we will post it on our website soon. So thank you again for joining us. Stay safe, happy holidays. Um, hope to see you next time and good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.